A couple of truths for you before I begin my story. Litherlax lives in the puddle on the Westwoods back lane. This is truth. Every kid north of the river knows it is such. And I can see what you're thinking. I know what comes to mind when I use the word puddle. A small, shallow patch of water at the edge of a path, maybe. Something to step into for a little splash. Well, Litherlax's puddle is nothing like this. Sprawling and vast, it covers an entire stretch of the aforementioned back lane, overgrown and bordered with mossy green rotted fence. And it's always there, always. Even at the end of the warmest summer days, the hottest, driest summer weeks, the puddle remains. It never shrinks or evaporates, and when it rains, when it rains, it bloats and swells to truly monstrous size, like a lake more than anything else. It's raining now, actually. The drops fall thick and fast under the surface of Litherlax's puddle. Another truth for you. Litherlax steals children. We don't know why and we don't know what for, but he takes them on their way home from school at night sometimes, and they never come back. We walk in groups for that very reason. Even the unpopular kids, the loners, we all walk in little squads. We make detours and take illogical routes to ensure that everyone has someone else beside them right up into their own street. Because of these measures, there aren't really any loners or unpopular kids anymore. Which is nice, I guess. A shame about the circumstances, but it is what it is. I tighten my grip on my baseball bat. A low-grade weapon, to be sure. But I lack the courage to take a knife from the rack in the kitchen. A curious thing for me to say, I guess, considering that I now stand at the entrance to the home of a monster. But I would rather this than have to face my mother and justify the thievery of a knife. It's a different kind of courage, I guess. Parker stands to my left. He rubs at a band-aid on his elbow. The rain splashes on the peak of his cap. Faded blue, gone gray with age. He wields a hammer. Taken from his dad's toolbox, I guess. I doubt the man would care. Lauren stands to my right. Hair tied back and beneath the plastic yellow of a raincoat. She holds a hockey stick like a staff in her left hand. She looks at me, her deep brown eyes full of anxiety. It feels weird being here, as a group of three. Our fourth has been taken by Litherlax. He has been taken away like so many before him, into the depths of the puddle on the Westwoods back lane. I take in a deep breath of the chilled, wet late afternoon air. I turn to the boys behind us. Their names aren't important for now, but they're a couple of grades above us. Bullies, basically. The types who enjoy harassing others for their own amusement. But there is no harassment today. They stand as a solemn trio. Dutiful sentinels. The boy in the front steps forwards. I saw your friend leave off by himself. I could have called out to him. I could have made the decision to walk with him, but I didn't. I chose not to, and he was taken. I'm sorry, bro. I'm sorry to all of you. I nod in return, but say nothing as the rain falls fast all around. I know all of this already, of course, but I allow him to speak. We'll stand guard here until the sun sets. We can't stay any longer than that. You know this, Eric. I nod for a second time, but still say nothing. We'll keep you safe. Nothing will follow you down and nothing sick will come back up. We'll stand guard, he pauses. I hope you find your friend. The wind blows. I murmur a grave but genuine thank you in reply and turn back to the great puddle. We are surrounded by trees here and a misty haze borders the edges of our vision. It gives the back lane an unsettling, otherworldly quality. Here we go then, I guess. Parker mutters to my left. 
He gives the band-aid on his arm a last rub, smoothing it back into place and holds the hammer tight in his hand. He's scared. We all are. No one goes down after Litherlax. I mean, it's insane. Insane and yet, enough is enough. If we don't try and put a stop to this now, then when? Our friend has been taken and he needs to be saved. It's as simple as that. Benny. His name is Benny. Parker takes a step and then another, and then with a splash, his foot comes down into the water at the edge of the puddle. Lauren stirs beside him and a shiver of goosebumps shoot up across my arms. We're actually doing this. We're going down after Litherlax. Parker pauses for a moment, and gathering himself perhaps. And then calmly and coolly, he continues his walk. About seven or eight feet into the puddle, we watch as he starts to descend. As if marching down unseen steps, he sinks lower and lower into the water. It comes up to his knees and then to his waist, and still he descends. It's a bizarre spectacle, but it's what we were expecting. Parker starts to freak out as the water reaches his chest and I don't blame him to be fair. He panics and the illusion is immediately lost. He stumbles and slips in the water. There's a great splash and he is momentarily obscured by a flurry of white spray and then, there he is, lying on his chest in the puddle. A puddle which really doesn't seem all that deep at all. He grumbles angrily to himself and rises to a stand, repositioning his cap. The water which mere seconds ago came up to his chest now barely covers his feet. He starts to splash back towards us as he drips from the front of his shirt. I'm sorry, he says through the rain. It was harder than I thought it would be. It's okay, I reply. You lost focus is all. You have to forget the water is there just to keep going down. Easier said than done though, obviously. I think to myself as my heart pounds in anticipatory fear. Parker stops as he returns to her side and he looks at me. Lauren does the same. The implication is clear. It's my turn to try. I squirm but steady my nerves. All right, here we go. I say quietly and then set out across the grass and into the waters of the puddle. A little quicker than I should perhaps, but I'm trying to stave off the urge to turn and run back the opposite way. Any second now, any second. I try not to react as I feel my foot come down lower than one would expect into the shimmering water, reflecting gray the overcast sky up above. I keep pace, fist clenched, breathing steady. And down I go, step by step. The water rises up to my knees, step by step, up to my waist and then up to my chest. This is how far Parker was able to get. But I am able to go further. The water rises up to my neck. It's cold, it's so cold. The rain is loud against the water beside my ears. I take a breath and I close my eyes, and my head dips below the surface. I keep walking down. The sound of the rain is muffled and grows quickly fainter and fainter above me. The water feels thin somehow, not quite as thick as water is supposed to be. Down and down, step by step. I try releasing my breath as I descend. I feel nor hear no bubbles come rushing from my lips, so I try for a cautious intake and find that I am able. I open my eyes, and I come to the bottom of the stairs. Ahead stretches a long, straight and wide corridor, grand, like the kind you would find in a mansion. The walls are a deep, rich red brown and the carpet is a moss-like green. I lift a hand and examine myself. The sensation is a curious one as my movements have definitely been dulled and the objects caught in my line of sight waver ever so steadily. But my motion still feels closer to amidst air than amidst water, if that makes any sense to you. I turn around, 
My vision wobbles gently as I do so. After a second or two it is settled, and I see behind me a set of wide and imposing stairs. They ascend up and up to the shimmering and through the shimmering watery veil-like ceiling. Whoa. A set of feet appear through this veil. Down they come to be followed by a plastic yellow raincoat. Lauren. Her eyes are screwed tight shut and she's clearly holding her breath. But as she draws closer and closer to the bottom of the stairs, she cautiously opens an eye and then another. Seeing me standing here as I am, she finds the courage to try breathing and finds that she is able to. This is so weird, Eric, she murmurs. Her voice is a little distorted. She walks across the grass-like carpet to the nearest wall and looks up at the paintings that are hung there. Have you seen these? I've noticed them but haven't studied them closely. They hang at regular intervals and trail all the way down both walls and into the corridor as far distance. I step up beside her for a closer look. The painting, and indeed all the paintings by the look of it, are of children. The one in front of Lauren and I is of a girl, about 12 or 13 in age. I don't think she's from this decade. I would certainly raise an eyebrow if I saw somebody on the street with such a hairstyle and curious choice in clothes. Parker had made his way down the stairs now. He tugs his hat a little tighter down onto his head, afraid perhaps that it's going to float away. What the hell is this place? He wonders aloud. It's certainly not quite what we were expecting. Come on, I say to them. Let's get moving. And so we do. We start to walk down the long level corridor illuminated by quaint chandeliers hung up against the ceiling. Our shadows, many as they are, seem to ripple softly against the carpet. I look at the paintings as we pass them by, nerves racing. The more we pass, the more the clothes and styles start to become familiar. Some of the kids look as young as five, some like the first girl in their mid-teens, but none of them are smiling. They look out at us passers-by with expressions of longing and loneliness. They're haunting in their authenticity. It's subtle at first and it takes a while for us to notice, but after about 15 or 20 minutes of walking, it becomes clear that the carpet is longer than it was before. Even wilder, it sprouts up in places like grass or weeds, like moss drifting in a river. As we walk, this weed-like grass rises higher. It reaches our knees as the corridor comes at last to an end, 40 or 50 minutes from the stairs. The corridor opens and widens into a great hall. Pillars tempered with iris and watery green ferns mark the corners. A pedestal of chipped white stone stands in the center, and the carpet reaches almost to its peak. There's something coming. Lauren murmurs and the hairs in the back of my arms bristle and rise. We huddle a step closer together, us three warriors beneath the puddle on the Westwood's back lane. Movements catch my eye, but I can't tell if it's legitimate or a trick of our shimmering surroundings. The grass-like weeds of the carpet waver in the thick wet of the breezeless air. Anxiety rises. Parker tightens his grip on the hammer. A motion that makes noise. Lauren starts to nervously hum a little tune. It's a habit of hers. Her reasoning is that characters in horror movies are never taken or killed while singing an upbeat tune. This evening, she has chosen the theme to the old sitcom, Perfect Strangers. We listen to the melody as we await the arrival of some monstrosity from one of the off-shooting corridors. Lither lacks himself, perhaps. Who knows? Parker eventually snaps. Cut it out already, Lauren. You're not helping. She does so wordlessly and I can almost feel the flood of regretful immediate guilt flowing out of Parker and into the hall. I'm sorry, he says at once. I'm just nervous is all. It's okay, she says. There's another long pause, rich with tension, and I pick up the tune where Lauren left off. Whistling, she joins in as does Parker, and we begin to push deeper into the hall, 
steadily approaching the pedestal in the center. The snake appears when we're about three or four feet away. A deep, greenish gray. It blends in well with the surrounding grass and we come to an instant stop as it slithers out from the weeds. Around the pedestal it goes and goes, around and around until it is coiled upon its perch, staring down at us with two unblinking golden eyes. Its tongue flickers briefly out and then retracts at once. It looks from Parker to Lauren and then to me. It opens its mouth and I find myself curiously unsurprised to hear it speak. Its voice is deeper than I would have expected for such a creature, and its tone is low and steady. You have made a mistake in coming here, children, the snake tells us. Its tongue flickers out again. Others have crept below in search of friends and family. You are not the first. Were they successful? I asked the reptile. And did they save their friends from Litherlax? For this creature is not the great he. I feel it on an intuitive level. Litherlax lives, the snake replies. With respect, that is not what I asked. The snake uncoils a little, slowly lowering its head a few inches closer towards me. I stand my ground, but both he and I notice the adjustment of the hammer in Parker's hand to my left. I wouldn't try it, boy, the snake says to him. I may be large, but I am the quicker by far. You would be dead before the weapon was even raised. Have you seen our friend? Lauren interjects, her soft tone diffusing the tension by a degree or two. Our friend Benny. The snake pauses. He turns to her and tilts his head in thought. Hmm, Benny... Is that the name you say? Yes. The snake's tongue darts out and flickers before us. He pulls back with a sigh. I am afraid you are simply too late. The litherlax dawdles not. It is too late. Your friend has been drained. Turn back, lest the same fate befall the three of you. Please, I turn back. My heart pounds with panic, but I step forward, pointing a finger at the creature on the pedestal. No, I say, that can't be right. Benny's braver than all of us. She's the best of us. She would never let herself get drained. Alas, I saw it with my own eyes. She is gone. Turn back while you can. Litherlax roams these corridors. My heart rate settles just a little. He fell for the trick. I lower my hand to give the snake a quick dry grimace. I think you're lying to us, reptile. You don't seem to know much about human names. Benny isn't a she. Benny is a he. Your eyes may be unblinking, but I think you saw nothing. The snake adjusts his position and hisses from the back of his throat. So we're going to continue on our way. If you try to stop us, and then we'll fight you. I don't want to do that, and neither do you. So let's just go our separate ways and in good faith. The snake raises his head. You are foolish. Danger and despair await you down these corridors. I implore you to turn back and save yourself the heartache and the pain. We aren't going to turn back, says Parker. We won't. Then you are doomed, replies the snake and down he goes. Uncoiling down the pedestal, he creeps back into the grass of the carpet and slithers away, quickly lost to sight amongst the weeds. Three further corridors branch away from this hall, and the one that leads ahead seems as good a choice to take as any. So we soldier on, pushing through the green, as Litherlax awaits in the deep. We round the central stone column and leave the hall behind, marching onwards down the overgrown corridor. We do not dwell on the rumbling that echoes behind and beyond the ornate walls. Drained, Lauren murmurs after a while. That's what the snake said. Well, the snake was lying, Parker replies. If he had actually seen Benny, then he wouldn't have fallen for Eric's trick. 
No, Lauren says. I mean drained like, what did he mean by drained? Parker has no answer. Uh, probably best to not think about it. I sit quietly as the kids in the portraits watch us pass by. Lauren murmurs in reluctant agreement. The corridor stretches on. The ever-present thread of our limited time presses against the back of my head. Litherlax's puddle can only be entered towards the day's end, but when the sun sets and night falls, that's when the creatures return to the water. The clock ticks, and as if in response to these thoughts, a distant and watery voice echoes down from the ceiling. It reverberates softly through the walls. The voice of one of the sentinel trio up above and guarding the puddle. Eric! Eric. Comes the faraway voice and we pause to listen. The creatures, the creatures have begun their crawl, crawl to the water. water. We, can we can keep, keep them, them back, back for now, now but they're coming. coming. Be, as Be as quick, quick as, as you can, can bro. bro. We hasten along, hearts pounding in tune. The corridor rounds a corner and ends abruptly at a dining room of sorts. There is a deserted bandstand in the corner and a podium for a non-existent server to welcome the guests. The tables are many and they are draped in lily pad leaf-like cloth. Half the walls are covered in portraits, but only half. The walls further ahead through all the visible open doorways are bare. Parker gently knocks my arm with the butt of his hammer and points and we follow his gaze. A short squat figure facing away from us hums softly to himself in the corner of the dining room. He's a painter of some kind, working away at a sheet of rich paper stretched across an easel canvas. With nerves of steel, we creep through the room, the sound of our slow movements dulled by the thickness of the air around us. Closer we approach, closer and closer, and it becomes apparent that the figure is no man. What we had mistaken for a gray jacket is merely the shading of his slimy skin, skin that is tinged and tipped in green. His feet are webbed and legs bowed. He is, proportionally speaking, an enormous frog, though one no taller than I. I nod to Parker and the boy reaches out. He grabs the frog roughly by the shoulder. The amphibian promptly squeals in distress and is shoved to the ground. His paintbrushes go clattering to the floor and the sharpened side of Parker's hammer is pressed against his neck. Lauren's hockey stick and my own bat are pointed right down to his face as his bulging eyes dart from person to person. He croaks and struggles. What are you doing here? He blurts. You aren't victims. Unhand me, filth. Where is our friend? And don't mess with us. We already dealt with your pal the snake. Parker is careful to leave our interaction ambiguous and the frog's eyes widen in fear. Who? He stutters his words. Who is your friend? Benny. Benny. He's the one in your painting, says Lauren softly. With a chill, I turn to look. The painting is only half finished. There remains a great deal of shadow and realism still to be added. But the portrait's occupant is clear. It's Benny, all right. The frog's eyes flicker from Lauren to the painting and back. The others will be here soon, he murmurs. They will take you to Litherlax, if he hasn't found you already. The walls rumble. Where is he? I reiterate. The boy in your painting, we aren't leaving until we find him. The frog's throat swells anxiously, throbbing. You are too late. By the time the painting's finished, the boy will be drained. Well, then we aren't too late, are we? I reply coolly. It isn't a question. Your painting remains unfinished. The frog struggles, but Lauren presses the hockey stick against his slippery green skin, and Parker adjusts his distribution of weight. I lean in closer. We'll kill you if we have to, slave of Litherlax. I didn't want to kill this thing, I have no desire to and probably wouldn't if it came down to it. But if scaring him will make him tell us where to find our friend, then so be it. The frog whimpers in dismay. If he doesn't get his victims, 
he whispers. Then he comes for us, the pond folk. We do what we have to do, child. Which way? The frog's eyes dart to one of the offshooting corridors and I nod. He'll drain you, the frog squeaks. That's a risk we're happy to take. This next part gives me no pleasure, but we can't afford to take any risks. These creatures from otherworldly domains, they speak in riddles and half-truths, I'm sure of it. By the time that the painting is finished, the boy will be drained. Lauren, I say, pin his arms. Lauren presses forwards with the hockey stick and puts all her weight upon it, trapping the hands and arms of the frog above his head against the mossy green ground. Wait, no, let me go, he struggles in panic. I'm sorry, I say, but your painting is it connected to the fate of the children. The frog does not respond. I clench my jaw. The painting, is it important? Is there anything more that we need to know? The frog stares back at me defiantly, silently, angrily. Parker speaks up. What if we were to break your hands, huh? What if you couldn't finish the portrait? No, shrieks the frog. Don't. And his tongue darts out from his mouth like a fist, slapping wetly into Parker's eye. The boy cries out and reaches up for it freeing the frog's neck from the hammer. The frog shifts and kicks out, knocking Lauren back with a powerful leg and with a sharper traction of his tongue, he's free. I jump for him, but the creature is too slippery. He pushes me off and bounds away through the halls, croaking and warbling and warning as loud as he can. There's no way that we'll be able to catch up. Each of his hops might as well have been ten paces or more. I point to the easel as my heart races. Grab that painting. Already on it. Lauren replies as she rolls it up and stuffs it into her coat. By doing so, another picture on the floor besides the easel is knocked over. This one looks complete but for its framing. I don't get a good look at it before it lands, however, and it is quickly obscured from sight. Hey, let's get a move on. If they didn't know that we were here before, they do now. Come on, this way. And together, we run down the route that the frog implied, out from the dining hall and past a multitude of curious rooms. One contains a garden of sorts, another a collection of statues. The air seems to grow thicker as we run. It becomes harder and harder to push our limbs forward and onwards. Our run slows into a jog, even at full effort. God, I murmur through grunts. It shouldn't be this difficult. We push on into another wide hall. No tables in this one, though, just a statue of a grim-faced toad, blindfolded and wielding in its hand a set of scales held in precarious balance. They've, They've started, started getting, getting through, through guys. guys. Comes, Comes that, that distant and distorted, distorted voice, voice from the world above. above. There's, There's too, too many, many. we can't, can't stop, stop them all. Them. Hurry, Hurry, they're, they're coming. coming. I study the statue. The scales are held in an angle and each of the weighing pans point down a different corridor. We're close now, I can feel it, and there's a choice to be made. I let out a low sigh and adjust my stance, and as I do so, a curious thing happens. A trickle of bubbles escapes my lips and drifts up high, where they are lost in the shimmering light of the ceiling. There's a pause as both Parker and Lauren stare in horror, and Parker drops his hammer in fear. It falls slower than it should. Bubbles start pouring from his mouth as he gasps. There's no air, he cries out, and it seems for a terrible moment as if his suspension of disbelief is lost. For him, the illusion is broken. How are we even able to breathe down here? I can't get in any... He falls to his knees and clutches his throat, rasping. It's just water, he shrieks. Water. Parker, Lauren and I crouch down beside him. You can talk. You can breathe. We're doing so now and you can do the same. It's thick and it's wet, but it's air. Come on, breathe in and out. Parker's face is turning red. He panics, spluttering and choking. Come on. Breathe in and out. 
and he struggles. He tries to match our breathing. To do so at first, it causes him great distress, but he calms himself down and the bubbles slow their streaming. His breathing slowly sinks up with ours and gradually he regains control. A minute or more perhaps and the bubbles stop entirely. Parker wipes a sheen of sweat from his forehead. I've cost us time. I'm sorry. Hey, it's alright, I say to him. But he is right. We raise our heads as the statue before us starts to shake. A voice rumbles through the walls. But this is not the voice of any of the teenagers up above, of the trio guarding the puddle, nor of any low frog or snake. This is a voice much lower, much darker, much angrier. The voice sends a tremor of dreamlike fear pouring and splashing like cascading waves through my body. It is his voice, I'm certain, as it surely can be the voice of no other. Litherlax. Intruders, intruders in my hall. I smell your blood, children of the surface. Dawdle not. Face me if you would face me. Come meet your end and be done with it. I turn to the corridor on the right, almost instinctively. That's where he is. Litherlax awaits down the corridor to the right. But down the corridor to the left, there is a movement. A person, a child. There's another child down here in this place. A small girl, maybe just over half our age, appears anxiously around the corner. One hand pressed to the wall as she looks us over uncertainly. Hey, are you okay? I call out to her. She panics. She slips and stumbles and turns. The disheveled nature of her hair and clothes is made briefly clear and she disappears away. Come back, Lauren shouts, but the girl does not. Lauren starts to go after her, and then stops, pausing and looking to me. They both do, her and Parker. I glance from corridor to corridor, and at the statue between them. Time, Time takes, takes away. away, rumbles the ethereal voice of Litherlax from the depths of the unknown. Come now, or never. Eric? Lauren asked desperately, what do we do? I fumble for the words. Time ticks indeed. If we go after Litherlax, then we will likely never see the girl again, so she'll be doomed down here. But if she has survived down here for so long already, then who's to say she won't survive a little bit longer? But you don't know how long she's been down here, Eric. They might be hunting her at this exact moment. She's younger than Benny, though. Far younger. What chance does she have alone? Hell, maybe it's a trap. My decision, however, is made for me. It is made for me, and I do not have to stress the guilt of choosing one over another. Parker breaks off from the group, reaching down and grabbing up his hammer, running as fast as he's able given our surroundings. He heads down the corridor to the left after the girl. Turning back over his shoulder, he shouts, Go find Benny. Don't wait up for me. Just save him and get yourselves out of here. Go! He disappears from sight around the corner. I grab Lauren by the sleeve of her raincoat and drag her to the right, and together we run in desperate pursuit of our friend and the monster that took him below. The thick green gray of the carpet reeds and water grass is now almost waist high and it brushes wetly against us as we push on through the corridor, ignoring the occasional bursts of bubbles dispelled from our movements through the undergrowth. The air is thick now and heavy. The walls as grand as they are are slimier. The reek of the place grows stronger and stronger as we pass by room after room. The reek is litherlax, I'm sure of it and we're close now. Every time we round a corner, I think that this might be it. This might be the one, but the corridor stretch of maddeningly on. They are coming, echoes the voice of our guardians above the surface of the puddle. The pond folk return to the puddle. Do you think that'll be okay? Lauren pants breathlessly. Uh, Parker, do you think you'll be all right without us? 
I don't know. We get to focus on Benny first. One hurdle at a time, we go for Benny. The light is changing ahead. Since the beginning, an aura of subtle blue-green has tinted our surroundings, but that ends at the next corridor. Viscous red shadows are thrown from stone ornaments against the walls. As I breathe in, I can taste the faint tang of something metallic and bitter. Lauren shoots me a glance. I read her mind in the expression. Litherlax. We slow to a cautious stop. Hearts pounding and creep around the final corner, ducking behind a statue of an eel, coiled and silent. My innards clench in revulsion at the sight that lies ahead. The corridor ends in the largest room so far, a great and kingly hall with a single long table that extends almost from wall to wall. The wild grass-like life of the carpet is less obvious in here. The floors are clearly carefully maintained and often trimmed. There are windows in the wall, the first that I've seen, but beyond the colorful stained glass is only gently swirling and watery mist. Each window is flanked by statues of Litherlax himself, and the great table is covered sickeningly and carelessly in the bodies of his victims. I feel a sharp pain and realize that Lauren is perhaps unconsciously clenching my hand in terror. The bodies have indeed been drained. There's no other word for it. Drained. As warn the snake. As warn the frog. They are all children, and they are all long dead. Their eyes look blindly out at nothing from the hollows of their heads. They are little more than veinless skins of white and gray, Pulled taut across the skeletons within, piled and sprawled across the tablecloths from end to end. My teeth clench hard and I raise my gaze. The frog is here too, beyond the table at the far side of the room. His shadows are many and red, cast from the ruby chandelier that hangs overhead. His neck is craned back. He croaks and throws out his arms and pleads with the very creature that we have come all this way to see, the Colossus upon his enormous throne of cold and mossy red stone. He is Litherlax, a bulging, leaking, and writhing leech, monstrous in size, his squirming sends ripples of disgusting noise reverberating around the walls. Slimy and shiny and black, he pulsates grotesquely and the reddish light from the chandelier catches in the faint scarlet markings that run all the way down his various segments. His middle is thickened and bloated and heaving, and the only distinguishing feature that differentiates his head from his tail is a throbbing distended ring coated in black ooze that now hangs menacingly above the quivering, pleading frog. But it makes no sense for monocles. The great, the great leech, leech warbles. warbles. His mouth does not move in time to the words, rather they seem to seep from the membrane of his very skin. I do not understand how they found the strength to breathe. You assured me that the air was thicker than human children could handle, one forced to exertion. It should be. Oh, Litherlax, the great drainer. They must have tricks. They are sneaks, arrogant and stupid. Litherlax's voice drops an octave. His wet and pulsing mouth lowers closer to the anxious frog. My ask not for excuses. Tell me at the least, did you finish the portraits? Are they ready for hanging in my gallery? For monocles, the frog squirms from leg to leg. I, I finished the first, Litherlax King. The girls. Litherlax rumbles and he draws back ooze leaking from his ring of lips and onto his throne with a splatter. That will do then, for now. Lauren and I exchange a fearful look. The girl, does he mean the young one in the corridor? The one that Parker ran after? Our question is answered immediately, however, and we are wrong. Litherlax slithers round in a quick half circle, his lower body thrumming excitedly as he reaches up to the high ceiling. We follow his movements and gasp. Lauren slams a hand over her mouth. I can't believe that we didn't see them sooner. In cages colored in the same patterns at the ceiling, 
hung from great long chains are two children, a girl of about fourteen, and Benny. Bring the cages around and open the first. For monocles darts to the edge of the room and pulls on a great gray lever, freeing a metal wheel in the wall which he then spins around in a slippery grip. With a great clank and grinding of gears unseen, the cages, following some kind of rusted rail, jerk awkwardly along their roots and closer to the center of the room, above the great table. Eric, Lauren hisses, what are we going to do? But I don't know. I don't know what to do. The cage with the teenage girl in starts to descend, swinging on its chain as it does so and then six or so feet above the table, the floor of the cage slams open, and the girl falls screaming to the pile of corpses below. And with the speed surprising for his bulbous and bloated size, Litherlax darts forward. His gray-black oozy ring of lips peels sickeningly back to reveal three pinkish-gray beak-like jaws. Please... The girl cries out in panic, bubbles pouring from her mouth as she throws up her hands in meager defense. But she stands no chance. Litherlax's fangs, each no bigger than my own fist, munch deliriously into her side and with a squirt of blood as she is brought down writhing. The creature's lips roll back over the fangs to fix like suckers on the girl's side and in the space of no more than ten seconds he drains her. His body pulsates as great gulps of blood are drawn into his focused, contracting and monstrous body. His innards groan and growl with satisfaction, as the girl withers like a leaf before our eyes. The frog watches from the sidelines, a picture of quiet terror. Does he see himself in the place of the girl, perhaps? I do not know. Litherlax gorges for another full minute, draining the girl of every last possible drop. The gears turn in my head, piecing together all the information that I have available, creating a plan as best as I can. The frog, despite his nerves, finds the courage to clear his throat and to interrupt. My, my lord, the children, the surface dwellers, they will be here soon, surely. Litherlax grunts and disconnects with a shower of droplets of blood, he raises his head to the ceiling, quivering as his sucker-like mouth throbs in pleasure. The girl's corpse tumbles from the table to join another on the grassy floor. He laughs. He chortles and his segments shiver and quake. Oh, for monocles, worry not. I smelled the surface dwellers the moment they arrived. He swivels and his dark wet mouth now points precisely this way. My blood chills in its veins. They are already here. Litherlax darts suddenly forwards and with a burst of adrenaline, Lauren and I scramble to the side, running out into the hall as Litherlax knocks into the statue. It totters but does not fall. Surface dwellers, victims to be, how good of you to deliver yourselves to me. I am most grateful. Lauren, I mutter, get to the lever, bring down Benny's cage. Yes, Lauren. Litherlax laughs and taunts as he slithers around us like an oozing leviathan, knocking bodies beyond count to the floor as he moves over the table and blocks Lauren's path to the wall. Get to the lever. What can you hope to achieve in my halls, children? You are outmatched and outclassed. You have wandered to your doom. I pause in fright and worry that perhaps the great leech might well be right. I look at my hands at Lauren's. Our weapons will do little against this thing. A bat and a hockey stick. Blunt instruments. The body of Litherlax would need to be pierced to be seriously harmed, and the only one of us with a weapon of any sharpness at all is Parker, who chose the path on the left. I look to Lauren, and she looks back and sees the determination in my eyes. The plan still holds, they say, and she gives me a brief, almost imperceptible nod. I sidestep away from her, throat wet and moist with the thickness of the air and I force out a string of taunts. You disgust me, Litherlax. Why do you lurk down here in the depths? 
You only ever take one child at a time. Are you ashamed, is that it? Ashamed of surface dwellers seeing you for what you really are. A common leech bloated behind its place. I see the frog tense up against the wall in dismay. Litherlax bubbles in frost with indignation, turning his full attention to me as Lauren steps slowly but deliberately around him, past the table of bodies and steadily over to the wall. The frog sees your approach but dares not to speak for fear of breaking the tension and drawing the focus of Litherlax's rage. How dare you? Litherlax blusters, his body bulging and his head dropping almost to my level, his sucker-like mouth pulsating angrily, leaking ooze to the floor by my feet. His breath reeks of iron and blood. Do you not see how I drained my latest meal? I could do the same to you now with ease. I hold my ground, sweat leaking down my back. He pauses. But I must admit... To make, to make it this, this far, far to stand, stand against, against such power and strength with such boldness, I respect, I respect that, that. As, much as much as I might pretend otherwise. otherwise. I, will I will give you, give you one, one final chance. chance. Turn, turn tail and return to the surface. Turn around, turn around now and never come back. This sudden change in demeanor sends my alarm bells ringing. I don't buy it for a second. This supposed random compassion. This creature who steals children from the surface. He who drains them of all their blood and leaves them strewn about his halls. I have seen his speed and his strength, yes. I don't doubt that he has the power to drain me in seconds if he so chose. But he hasn't, has he? I glance up to the cage, suspended by its chain. Benny looks down at me, silent but eyes wide, hands gripped tight around the bars. And nor has Litherlax drained Benny. I glance from the statues of Litherlax to his enormous throne, to the cowering body of her monocles, the artist frog. I consider the portraits in their hundreds, lining the walls of Litherlax's below puddle, pond mansion home. It's his pride. That's why he can't bring himself to drain me, and his pride will be his downfall. Lauren is reached for monocles and the frog at last can contain himself no longer. My lord, he croaks desperately, ducking to avoid the smack of Lauren's hockey stick against the wall behind him. Do it, Lauren, I shout to her, keeping my eyes firmly on the Thurlax. If he has eyes himself, I cannot see them. The Thurlax pays the commotion no mind and I address my next words to he. As Lauren pulls the lever and turns the wheel, Benny's cage rattles down the chain and drops, opening at the base and our friend falls down onto the corpses below with a grunt. Litherlax, I begin. Litherlax, you liar. You compassionless monster. As much as you might want to, you can't eat us now, can you? You just can't. Because we haven't been immortalized as portraits, as trophies for your gallery. God forbid you lose track of your conquests. Litherlax sees, raising himself up to his full height, but I continue, fists clenched and legs shaking. What if you were to go right ahead and drain us right here and now? Would your frog servant be able to complete the portraits having seen us so little? You would screw them up, surely. They would be wrong, embarrassing mistakes. Permanent reminders of the children who dared to come down and face you, here in your lair. I nod to Benny now by my side, cowering from the Great Leech. We've destroyed Benny's work in progress, I lie, thinking about the picture currently rolled up in Lauren's jacket. Does for monocles possess the talent to start from scratch, using nothing but his own memory? I shoot an icy glare to the frog across the room and he cowers back as if stricken with a blow. Lauren has begun to make her way around the edge of the room. The walls shake. So I think we're done here, Litherlax. We'll be on our way now. Litherlax throbs for a moment more and then screams down towards us, hot and blood-rich watery air sent blasting across our faces. I should drain you now for your insolence. How dare you? How dare you? He splutters and rise, 
angrily slamming his tail across the table and knocking the myriad of bodies to the grass. Respect is a two-way street, you disgusting leech. I reply levelly. Litherlax rise in rage, but he does not strike and I can only presume that my theory holds. I reach out for Lauren's hand and I haul Benny up to his feet by the back of his shirt. And together, we back our way out from the hall. Fine. 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 Consider, Consider yourselves escapees, escapees if you will. Enjoy, Enjoy your, your victory, victory while it lasts. lasts. You may be spared the fate of my power, children of the surface, but the pond folk will have you. They will tear you apart as pond scum and feast upon your bones. So go, go to them, go to them and reap your reward. Litherlax swivels and pulsates, slithering his way back to the throne as tail whips back and slams into the wall, leaving a dent into deep dark stain. The ground rumbles and the pond folk approach. Guys, Benny begins, his voice rich with gratitude and surprise. But there is no time, not now. We just run, us three, back the way we came. It's harder now to retrace our steps, but we do our best. Running from corridor to corridor as the general roar and rumble that one associates with crowds grows louder and louder ahead. We hear shouting and panic and clamor. Corner after corner, and there, at the statue of the toad with the scales, lays Parker. He has his arm thrown around the girl, and they cower together in the center of a commotion. He had found her. A ring of creatures surrounds them. They are angry and frustrated and scared. Some as big as me, some smaller, some larger. Parker turns to us at the sound of our approach, bruised and jaw clenched tight. The air once again seems thick, far too thick. It's curious how it comes and goes. Bubbles drift up from the disturbed grass to the misty ceiling, and I do my best to ignore them. Parker is unarmed, and after another second of scanning the crowd, it reveals his hammer is held tightly in the hand of a newt, raised and poised as if about to strike. The newt, along with his comrades, turn to regard us, his yellow eyes bulging, his pupils narrowing and widening with uncertainty. Intruders, he whispers, and the word is echoed amongst the others, the frogs and toads and turtles. An enormous fish, suspended impossibly above the ground and floating in place, raises a fin, her mouth gulps open. You think we can't feel it, she splutters. The tension in the water... Litherlax is disturbed, and it's all your fault. Who will he take out his anger upon? I ask you, who? A murmur of agreement ripples around the group. At the mention of water, I see a stream of bubbles rise up from Parker's mouth. He screws his eyes tight shut in concentration. I watch him regain control of his breathing. The girl clutches tight to his arm. Let us pass, Ponfolk. I say to them in a loud voice, let us go on our way. Look, I don't want to fight you. And we won't, Lauren interrupts. I turn to her as do all the eyes in the room. She steps forwards and drops her hockey stick to the ground. We aren't so different, really, we aren't. The tension is palpable, but they hold her words and she continues. Please, just let us go. We are sorry for disturbing you, for disturbing all of you, but we had no choice. And Litherlax is weak, weaker than he pretends. He cannot paint for himself his trophies. He needs your skills for that. The creatures look down to their hands, webbed in long and green and gray. He might be large now, but he relies upon the blood of his victims to grow. Blood that he struggles to drain before his conquest is immortalized. If he can't get his meals, he will shrink. And he can't get his meals if the paintings are never completed. He is bound by his pride. They look at each other, these creatures from below. There is a general murmur of unease, of cautious hope. Foolish girl, says the newt. He pushes aside his fellows and steps from the circle. 
If we try to hold Litherlax back from his prey, he will turn on us. He will drain us dry in their place. Has he ever? Is there even a single painting of one of your kind in this entire mansion? The newt stirs. I can see the watery cogs turn fast in his brain. He, he doesn't need portraits for us. We, we aren't worthy of the title of trophy. We don't need to be painted, surely. But he doesn't sound convinced. He just doesn't know. He doesn't know for sure. Please, Lauren urges, stepping forwards and taking his slippery hands in hers. Just let us go, just this time. The newt does not respond, but slowly ever so slowly as if fighting against his own instincts, he steps to one side. And following his lead, the others do the same. Silently they part and a path opens up through the crowd center. Parker is back on his feet. He clutches tight to the girl's hand and the five of us quietly make our way through the pond folk. We pass them all by, creature after creature, and we leave them behind. And then once the corner has been rounded, we run. We run for the final time back along the corridors, back past the rooms, back through the dining room and back through the hall with the snake's pedestal, back past the portraits, painting after painting, I detect from the portraits a faint smell of blood that I hadn't noticed before. And just as exhaustion threatens to take a hold, the stairs appear in our sights at the end of the hall. The gray stone steps. A little further, I call out. Just a little further. And before we know it, we feel the hard stone of the stairs beneath our feet. Up we climb and we feel the rush of the bubbles grow stronger now, irresistibly strong. They rush about our ears and blur our vision. Struggling to breathe now, I can only push forwards, hand held with someone else. I can't tell who in the madness. Climbing and climbing. And with a sudden gasp of cool night air, the puddle that's behind me. I become instantly aware that I am drenched to the bone. And stagger from the puddle with my hair in my eyes, leaking down my face. I stumble and slip, crashing down with a grunt back into the water. The water that now is surely no more than a few inches deep. I feel the rough, wet, stony earth of the ground against my hands beneath. I turn over onto my back and push my hair from my eyes, spitting out a mouthful of pond water, panting, and I see them. Lauren and Parker and the girl that he had rescued from below. And Benny, alive and safe. I grin at the boy and he grins right back. Lauren squeezes him into a hug and Parker does much the same. Jesus, comes a voice from behind. It's one of the trio, the kids tasked with guarding the pond. They did their best. I know that they would have held back the creatures for as long as they could. I turn to face him and as I do so, the girl that we saved runs straight from the water right into his arms. The remaining teenagers stare with their mouths wide open as the two emotionally embrace, and it becomes clear to me that the two are siblings. It's obvious, really, when you think to look. Emma, he chokes. I never thought that I would see you again. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I should have come for you myself if I had any idea that you would still be, still be alive. He trails off and breaks down into sobs and we watch as the moon appears from behind a cloud, bathing the dripping girl and her brother in its cool and silvery light. Movement to my right catches my eye. I look down to the grass. There sits a little frog. It regards me in silence, its neck swelling and contracting, the light of the moon shining as sparkles in the corners of its eyes. And then it hops down into the water and promptly disappears. It's been almost two months since then, and no more kids have disappeared. The teenager who blamed himself for Benny's disappearance has taken it upon himself to set up dedicated groups and patrols. No one walks alone, he proclaimed, and to this day he's kept his promise. Benny's fine. He worries that he'll never be able to truly repay the debt that he owes us, despite our constant reassurances that he owes us no debt at all. 
and Litherlax. I do not know if the pond folk ever conducted their uprising, but the seeds have at least been sown, and no one's seen or heard from him since. <laughs>